Um, back to the gene, and uh, a question we're, all, we're often asked with the transgenic uh, program is, how do you get the gene in? We actually use a pro uh, bacterium, a natural soil bacterium called agrobacterium. And in nature, agrobacterium puts in a little bit of its DNA to a plant. What happens in nature is it forms a gall, and then the, that kind of makes a habitat for the bacteria. A couple of uh, very wise scientists in the late 1970s realized that it's a particular place in the agrobacterium DNA that gets put into the plant, and we can take that, it's called the tDNA section, we can take that DNA out of the bacterium, we can put our own DNA into that same place, and the bacteria puts it into plant cells for us. Um, but we can't just put this bacteria on a tree and have it slide in some of the uh, slide in some of the DNA. That wouldn't make the whole tree transgenic. We need a whole tree that has these new genes. So we need to transform or put DNA in a cell and then grow a whole tree from a single cell. And that leads to a tissue culture procedure. Uh, some trees are very easy to work with like this and will grow from you know, a chunk of leaf. A single cell on a leaf will easily grow into a new tree on, uh, on some other species. Chestnuts are, uh, don't make this easy for us, so we isolate <coughs> immature embryos. We uh, collect nuts before they're ripe in the middle of the summer, take them apart, and take out what's called the embryo, just a little, tip, <coughs> a little bit in the tip of the nut. And it turns out, oh, it's a very rare, we had to do literally thousands of these before we had a couple of cultures of embryos that would actually grow. And um, I don't have a good picture of embryos alone, but basically once, once we isolate those embryos, we can grow more embryos. They, they, they'll continue to form new embryos under the right conditions. So we use the bacteria to put DNA into the embryos. Each of these spots here is a place where our new DNA was inserted. And but that's only a, a single cell or a few cells at this point. So we need to kill off all of this tissue that doesn't have the new DNA and grow up those cells into whole new embryos. And then we can, through different combinations of growth hormones and nutrients and so on, we can stimulate the embryos to start forming shoots. They go through a couple of kind of unrecognizable alien looking stages here. And then they suddenly form uh, shoots that you can almost recognize as plants. Uh, continue to grow those up and get a forest in a little cube, it's about this big, and um, we can continually propagate those also. If we cut those apart, put them in a different cube, they'll, they'll grow more shoots. So we can produce pretty much as many as we want um, of trees in tissue culture like this. So this, after they're grown up from a single cell, we can continually make more this way. Um, Again, through different combinations of growth hormones, we can uh, stimulate them to grow roots, or we can cut them up and grow more shoots, like I said. Uh, once they grow roots, they um, can be potted up into soil, into pots, grown in a greenhouse for a little while. We planted the first trees outside in 2006. Um, and then since then, we've had to scale up a lot. We're attempting to produce many thousands of trees per year um, at this point, which of course has its own challenges as we're a research lab and not a production nursery. But um, uh, that's our goal. That's what we're uh, working on so far. Once we have trees, so we, we've grown up trees, we can put them, grow roots on them, grow them in pots, grow them outside. How do we tell which ones are actually resistant to the chestnut blight? <coughs> Of course, the traditional method is to grow a tree till it's several years old, at which point it would start getting blight in nature. Um, cut a little hole in it, put in a plug of, uh, of the fungus, and <coughs> see what happens. Does the tree die? How big a canker does it get? So this requires several years to grow the tree, and then basically a whole <coughs> summer to do these uh, standard inoculations. Well, since we're testing so many genes, and for each gene we're testing, we want several different, what are called events. We're testing literally many hundreds of trees to see which ones are most blight resistant. So we wanted to speed this process up. And we actually developed a process called a leaf assay, where we'll put a little bit of the blight fungus onto a wound on the leaf. And after just a few days, we see a brown spot on the leaf. 
Now, this is not how chestnut light acts in nature. It doesn't affect leaves directly. But uh, what we've seen is that the size of this brown spot or necrosis on the leaf is a very good predictor of how the tree will, um, will act if, if the stem is inoculated, if the stem gets the chestnut blight. So this has saved us um, many, many years of work. And we're able to test trees when they're just a few months old and still inside the growth chamber. If we can collect several leaves from a given line of trees, we can screen those. And it's, it's still a preliminary assay. It's, it's not as, as precise, but we can tell if it's going to be more resistant than American chestnut, or it's about the same, it's not really resistant at all, and we're not gonna put any more energy or field space or time or, or money into, uh, into a line of trees that doesn't look promising. Uh, these are some results of stem inoculations. Uh, some of our older transgenic trees, this one is called uh, Darling 4. This is one we produced several years ago. It has the oxalate oxidase, but it's not produced, there's not as much oxalate oxidase as some of the newer events. So these are what we call our second generation um, oxalate oxidase or OXO trees. And the first year we did stem inoculations in 2012, this is, uh, blue line here is American chestnut. This is the size of the canker over 14 weeks in the summer. So American chestnut cankers grew very large by the end of the summer. This is what we expect. Chinese chestnut grew very small cankers. Green line on the Darling 4, for this year, the, the cankers were just a little bit bigger than the Chinese chestnut. They're definitely, uh, there's definitely something going on. It's showing some enhanced resistance compared to the American chestnut. The following year was not quite as dramatic, but we saw that the, the Darling 4 transgenic chestnut was uh, intermediate in resistance between the American and Chinese sizes. Uh, this year was pretty different climactically or <laughs> weather-wise. Um, but this pattern where the Darling 4 is intermediate between the American and Chinese chestnut is almost exactly what was predicted by our leaf assays, where the Darling 4 is, is intermediate in terms of the, the necrosis size on the leaf. Um, these are just some examples of stem. Um, <coughs> Cankers, American chestnut gets a big canker. This is a uh, this is, canker has wrapped all the way around the tree. It's girdled the tree, so everything above here is going to die. If not this year, then next. Uh, Chinese chestnut gets a small, we'd call it probably a superficial canker, where there's some damage, but it's not going to kill the tree. And the darling four, <coughs> our older transgenic chestnut, is right about in between. Moving from the darling four to some of our newer chestnuts, these are what we call third generation chestnuts. And this is not looking at canker size, this is looking at expression or production of OXO, of the actual enzyme that's, that's protecting the tree. And so our newer uh, chestnuts, this, these are called Darling 215 and Darling 311. Um, 215 has about 40 times more OXO than the Darling 4. And the uh, um, Darling 311 has more than 100 times more OXO. So with this new generation of trees, we basically ramp up the production of this transgene or the, the gene product, and we're um, seeing the results of that. Uh, Darling Fort, this is a summary of the leaf assay data where the American chestnut necrosis or brown spot size is normalized to one, and the Chinese chestnut size is this uh, red line down here. So Chinese chestnut always has a smaller canker or necrotic spot on the leaf than the American chestnut. Our transgenic chestnuts are the green bars. So once again, the Darling 4 is intermediate between American and Chinese, where these newer ones, Darling 215, looks about like the Chinese chestnut in terms of, uh, of size, uh, canker size on the leaf. Uh, the Darling 311 looks even better than the Chinese chestnut in terms of light resistance. These are leaf assay um, preliminary <coughs> data. So how do they do with um, on the stems. This is showing us that uh, when we produce more OXO, we're seeing the result. Uh, this is a time-lapse video that I want to show you, uh, showing the um, results of a small stem inoculation. Can you hear that at all in the back? A little bit of music. Um, what you're seeing is a non-transgenic American chestnut. This is from the same line as our transgenic chestnuts, just without the transgene. Next is a Chinese chestnut, which we expect to be resistant to the blight. And 
finally, we have two of our uh, newer transgenic American chestnuts. These have been inoculated. You can see where the tape is. That's where the um, blight fungus was applied. Yeah, there's, that's, that's not critical. Basically, you can see the, my voice, okay. You can see the American chestnut has completely wilted. Uh, Chinese chestnut and both transgenic American chestnuts are doing just fine. The trans gene is protecting them. It just dries up. It's, uh, it is pretty dramatic when the first time we uh, tested this. This is a close-up of the same stems that you saw in the video. American chestnut has this big damaged area from the canker, and then it's just turned black. It's, it's completely dead. Uh, Chinese chestnut still is damaged by the, by the inoculation, and sometimes, especially on these really small stem assays, the inoculation will actually kill a Chinese chestnut, um, just because of the, the relative size of the stem and dose of fungus that it's getting. In this case, the, the canker didn't wrap all the way around the stem, so there's still, you know, still a little bit of healthy stem that's kind of supporting the rest of the tree. That might heal up, it would probably heal up, and the tree would probably survive. And on the two transgenic chestnuts, there's even less damage than there is on the Chinese chestnut. So this is really exciting. This, this particular example is one of the first, uh, first examples we saw of really high levels of resistance in an American chestnut. Um, Moving from here, we'd really like to um, work with seedlings, with nuts, instead of with these tissue culture trees. Um, one way to do that, and just part of the further testing we need to do, is to see whether the transgene is passed on to a second generation. Um, works great in these trees we produce in the lab, but what will happen as the trees uh, cross with other trees, um, and so on. Um, We've actually been able to produce <coughs> pollen in, under certain conditions, under real high light conditions in both a growth chamber and a greenhouse. If we uh, really baby these trees, give them lots of light, just the right combination of fertilizer, we've seen pollen production in less than a year, which is really unusual for American chestnuts. Uh, usually uh, in the wild it's at least three up to five years before they produce the male flowers and a couple years after that before they start producing female flowers or burrs. Um, so producing pollen in the lab is, has been a big benefit to us. Uh, we're able to use that to do a few pollinations on um, some larger non-transgenic American chestnuts in our plots. And uh, this is the third, this will be about the fourth year that we've been able to collect nuts that, that are a result of a cross with transgenic pollen. Um, we have a whole bunch, a whole separate series of hoops we have to jump through with the USDA for them to allow this, including um, after we do the pollination, before the burrs start expanding, we have to take uh, aluminum mesh, like a window screen cages, and wrap them around the burr and staple them all closed. If a squirrel steals one of these nuts and runs off with that, that is a big violation and a mountain of paperwork for us. And uh, So we, we just can't allow that to happen. Or if the branch breaks off and the bag splits apart, we need to contain everything, we need to be able to document everything. It's, it's a, certainly a challenge, but when we've been able to collect these transgenic nuts, that has been um, really beneficial, enlightening to us. Uh, what we've seen is that the, um, this is the lab test of the expression of oxalate oxidase. It's not exactly the same between plants, but we've seen that the offspring, the, the transgenic offspring, still produce this oxalic acid. And this is uh, another leaf assay, <coughs> leaf assay result, testing young trees, uh, showing that the offspring, or that we call them T1s instead of F1s, um, the result of this transgenic cross, um, showing that these offspring are again intermediate in resistance between Chinese chestnut and American chestnut. So of the offspring that do inherit the transgene, they seem to have the same traits, both measured in the lab and measured for in, in field resistance. Um, as their parent did, the expression and the trait are inherited. Our goal here is to restore these to their natural habitat and to allow them to again become the keystone species, contribute to the ecology, 
if we want to do that, we don't want to plant a bunch of clonally identical transgenic chestnuts. We want to be able to plant a few outside and allow them to spread the transgene into the wild population. Of course, uh, regulations allowing. Um, so we'd like to produce some of our transgenic chestnuts, produce some pollen, and allow that the, allow it to spread basically by the pollen. So we're primarily um, integrating the, the genetics, the genetic <coughs> diversity of the existing population into any um, restoration <coughs> things. Um, comparing tissue culture production, where we've grown in the lab, where there's no, uh, there's no nut for it to uh, have all that stored energy, to the, the seedlings that we've produced. A seedling in the first season will grow about twice as tall as our uh, uh, tissue culture produced chestnuts. This isn't a result of the new genes. Non-transgenic trees we produce in tissue culture grow about the same way, but they're just much slower growing. There's just a huge amount of stored energy in that nut that, um, that obviously contributes to the initial, uh, initial growth of the chestnut. So just more evidence why we'd like to uh, move to a seedling production. Um, when we do grow the tissue culture derived trees that, that didn't grow from a nut, often they have a funny form. They grow like a branch for the first uh, couple of years, and we have a, a grad student right now who's doing a, um, a more in-depth study of kind of growth form of, of trees grown from tissue culture, and they have a lot of lateral growth. It looks just like a branch growing out of the ground for a while. You can see this one had this big crook at the base, and then it eventually started growing more <laughs> upright. But what we've seen is if we coppice these, after they become well-established, <laughs> come down, and uh, they produce new shoots. Um, we've seen extremely rapid growth. We're seven feet. We've seen up to uh, eight feet or even more of growth in a single season. And that regrowth after coppicing is um, is, is straight as, as any seedling. So it, it, it a way to restore form as well as uh, um, <coughs> well in our case to slow them down because we're not uh, we don't want everything to flower yet. Uh, that's part of a, the <coughs> regulatory restriction, I guess. If anything flowers, we have to either remove the flower before it ripens or cover it up. And we have too many trees to do that. So in some of our older plots, we had to just coppice the whole thing to delay flowering. Um, in addition to that, it brings back the straight growth. Uh, moving on to some other environmental research, of course we don't want to plan out anything that would uh, negatively affect the environment in any way. Um, so we are doing a variety of studies comparing our transgenic chestnuts to, um, to wild type, non-transgenic chestnuts in a variety of aspects of uh, ecology, uh, looking at insects, uh, plants that grow nearby, soil fungi, growth form, just looking at as many different comparisons as we can to make sure that we're not uh, causing any, any harmful changes here. We have a collaborator uh, named Bern Sweeney who does uh, aquatic research and he's been testing a few of our leaves where he's basically growing aquatic insects, mayflies and others, in, um, in simulated stream environments here uh, uh, on different types of leaves. So he has a jar with some of our transgenic American chestnut leaves, and a jar with some non-transgenic American chestnut leaves, and a jar with <coughs> Chinese chestnut leaves, also comparing them to native species like oaks and beeches that have kind of uh, um, taken over some of the American chestnut uh, range. And I don't have a graph, but what we're seeing is that the, the aquatic insects actually prefer chestnut leaves to the oaks and beeches that are there now. So the, he's measured increased growth and increased numbers of aquatic insects reared on chestnut leaves. So if the aquatic insects do better, then the trout and everything else in the streams uh, that eat the insects are going to do better too. So even though trout aren't going to eat whole chestnuts, they'll do better if we have American chestnuts back to their habitat. 